Good morning, everybody. It's not uh, not quite noon yet, but I am honored to introduce um, and bring to you this morning uh, Dr. Joycelyn Elders. I've known Dr. Elders for a long time. I don't want to really date myself or Dr. Elders, but um, I was a student of her husband, and I used to see Dr. Elders come over to Horace Mann uh, with the, her children to uh, visit the students and, and her husband. So uh, Dr. Jocelyn Elders, MD, is a 15th Surgeon General of the United States. She is a Professor Emeritus of Pediatrics, Division of Endocrinology at the University of Arkansas Medical Sciences, UAMS. Arkansas Children's Hospital in Little Rock, Arkansas. She is a distinguished professor of the School of Public Health at UAMS. There is a chair in her name in sexuality, education and medical schools at the University of Minnesota. A native of Shaw, Arkansas, and correct me Dr. Elders when you start speaking. <laughs> Dr. Elders is the oldest of eight children. At the age of 15, she received a scholarship from the United Methodist Church to attend Philander Smith College in Little Rock. Upon graduating at 18, she entered the U.S. Army as a first lieutenant and received training as a physical therapist. Dr. Elders attended the University of Arkansas Medical Sciences um, uh, on a GI Bill. After graduating in 1960, she entered she interned at the University of Minnesota Hospital in Minneapolis and did a pediatric residency and an endocrinology fellowship at the University of Arkansas Medical Center in Little Rock. She received a position of full professorship after her fellowship and board certification in 1976. She also holds a master's of science degree in biochemistry. Dr. Elders joined the faculty of UAMS as a professor of pediatrics and received board certification as a pediatric endocrinologist in 1978. Based on her studies of growth in children and the treatment of hormone related illnesses, she has written many articles for medical research publications. She was appointed director of the Arkansas Department of Health in October, 1987. While serving as director, she was elected president of the Association of State and Territorial Health Officers. Dr. Elders was nominated as Surgeon General of the United States Public Health Service by President Clinton in July the 1st, 1993. Confirmed by the Senate September 7th and sworn in September 8th. Dr. Elders served in this post until January of 1995 and subsequently returned to teaching uh, until her retirement in 1998. Arkansas Personalities of the South and Distinguished Women in America. She is a recipient of awards such as the Arkansas Democrats Women, Woman of the Year, the National Governors Association Distinguished Service Award, the American Medical Association, Dr. Nathan Davis Award, the Lee Doyle Humanitarian Award and the National Coalition of 100 Black Women's Candace Award for Health Science. Dr. Elders has also received multiple honorary doctor of medical sciences degrees, honorary doctorate of letters degrees. As an author, co-author of hundreds of professional publications in the area of pediatrics, endocrinology and public health. And as a national and international speaker, Dr. Elders is a strong advocate for children's health, quality patient care and health safety. She is on numerous boards and councils, including the Trojan Sexual Health Advisory Council, University of Arkansas Medical Sciences and University of Minnesota School of Medicine, National Center for Healthy Housing, Arkansas Children's Hospital Board. There are established chairs in honor of her at University of Minnesota, School of Medicine, Sexual Health Education, University of Arkansas Medical Sciences, 
health promotion and diseases prevention. Dr. Elders is married to, as we all know, coach Oliver Elders, and they have two sons, Eric and Kevin. With no further ado, Dr. Jocelyn Elders, Elders, you have your moment of, of, of truth. Thank you, Dr. Elders. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Coleman, for that very much too long introduction. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> but but that's, thank you. that's all right. Oh, it, it, some, oh, I don't know what I'm supposed to do. That's okay. You just, you ha have your way, Dr. Elvis. No, 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 no. I'm, I'm trying to get rid of something that's come, okay. come, up, come up on my screen. It said, I think it says, I'm, I'm supposed to say got it, I think. I'm not yes, leaving the meeting. I'm I think, well, you did. You know, I, 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 I've been on since nine twenty this morning. Yes, ma'am. To make sure I was on on, on time because I have so much trouble getting on. I, and I'm, I stayed because we had such excellent, excellent speakers, historians who gave us so much good history, and they've given us all that wonderful good history so much that now I don't feel I have anything to say. And I'm not going to use up your time saying nothing. But one of the things that I, I, I want you to know that as a, when I was in medical school, I as was a fellow and intern and I knew Dr. I knew all of those doctors and I knew Dr. Brown, Dr. White, Dr. Uh, and, and worked under them and we were there doing pneumothoraxes as medical students. So we, we are aware and I did, and I knew, and I went out there to visit the developmental center, and I'm very sad to know that it's being torn down. But I didn't know the history, all that history. You see, it was there. We worked there, so and so. I want to thank Dr. Hargrove for that wonderful, wonderful history. But I, he needs to get that written up so we can have it because my brain, you know, I can't remember much, so I won't remember all of that. Now. <laughs> I won't remember all of that just from his saying it. But I, to, you know, I really wanted to talk about uh, just to say a little bit about why we celebrate Black History Month. And today, I I really learned some some of the reasons is because one of the reasons we uh, some of the reasons is we want to make sure that we as we go back and look, we want to embrace our past. Well, we don't know our past, we can't be embrace our past. We want to educate our people, people like me, educate the rest of us, educate the presence so we can enhance the future and make it better. Because if we don't know anything about our past and we can't put it all together, we'll end up making the same mistakes over and over again. And I and, and I, so I, I want to thank our historians for what they've given, if not the rest of you, they educated one person, and that's me, and and I'm very grateful for that. But uh, the other thing is I want to go back and thank our father of Black History Week. You know, as he said, when we started out, it was colored. But they ne we never had never had colored history week. Then we had Negro History Week, and we all had to take Negro History Week when I was in school. And in 1976, uh, Gerald Ford, because they felt that we weren't getting enough, Gerald Ford made it Black History or uh, Negro History Month, and then it became African American. History Week, a Black History Week, and then Black History Week. So I've been through all of those, all of those stages, and I was around for each and every one of them. And I think we've made lots of progress. We've come a long way, and we've done a lot. Medicine has certainly come a long, very long way. We've come from when I started medical school, we couldn't even eat in the dining room. And I had to tell someone one time, 
I said, well, I didn't come here and I didn't get to medical school to eat. I've never eaten with white people. So I came to learn to be a good, the best doctor I could. And this was the place to be. So, so when I say we've come a long way, I truly mean we've come a long way. We've come a long way and you know, better training doctors. Whereas our doctors on the past may have been good. It may have been, you know, but medicine has come a very long way. We didn't have anything better to treat tuberculosis with in Dr. Brown's day, better than diet, rest, exercise, breathing. And then we went to uh, pneumothorax and then we went to surgery, more thoracoplasties and surgery where they collapsed the move, move. And now, you know, we have really super medicine. And, and, all of, and that just shows the progress we've made in medicine. And I'm a very proud of that. You know, as far as we've done a lot, we've come a long way. And I'm proud of where we've come, but I want you to know, don't get satisfied. We still have a very long, long way to go. You see, in 1937, because we didn't know, but Black History Week or month or whatever it was at that time, it was week then, they created themes. And so every year has a different theme. And the, year, the theme for this year happens to be health and wellness. That's the theme for 19, uh, or for 2022. The theme uh, uh, last year, for years before we've had themes on history, medicine, a dance, poetry, uh, uh, poetry uh, wars, fam the black family, uh, migration, immigration. So we've had all of those different themes. And this year we're talking about health and wellness. Well, I don't need to tell this group that black health and wellness has always been at, at the bottom of the totem pole. At least, you know, when we raise, raise it, but we know why. Because all we have to do is look now, at the social determinants of health. What are the things that determine health? Look at education. Look at poverty. Look at all the problems that we've had to overcome. The fact that we are alive is, 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 is progress. And yet the fact that we were able to come over, the fact that we're here and was able to come over on the boats and survive, said that we had to be tough. And, 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 and overcome many things. So I'm saying we've come a long way. The fact that I'm a doctor, growing up on a, 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 a sharecropper's daughter down on the farm. And my sisters and brothers had to pick cotton to get bus fare for me to come to Philanda. And it was only because of a lot of ge generous people that I was able to get uh, you know, be able to stay in school and 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 pro be providing funding for funding for stay in standing college. My uncle provided uh, money, a, a part of his army allotment for my room and board. He died just last week in Oklahoma City, and I went to the. But family, one of the things that black families did. They knitted together, they stayed together, they had to work together, but you had to do that to survive. You're talking about very often, you were often talking about survival. But so and I'm going to, I'm just skipping over a lot of things and just going through a lot of things because one of the things we've certainly found out, we know we're better together. And we know, we, but we're, we aren't, we're trying, we're getting away from that, but most of us know that we're, where we've come a long way and we're much better, better together. We, we, many people say, well, you know, why is Black History Month in February? Well, it was because when Dr. Carter Woods, uh, Woodson, the father, and they were putting it together, the two important black people 
Abraham Lincoln's birthday was February 14th or 15th, and Frederick Douglass's birthday is in February, it was February 14th. These were two important people that have impacted Black history and Black community, and, and they were named, it was named because for them and because of them. So I think that that's a, 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 a very important. So in our coming a long way, the thing we've come, the greatest, uh, uh, it, we've come a long way in health and education, but we're still far, far behind. We know that our facilities aren't the same. And whereas Arkansas in the United States, we have absolutely, we're the richest country in the world. We have the fewest people and we rank number 37 in health. When we talk about black women and, 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 and uh, premature babies, we're absolutely at the bottom. We're below Afghanistan. So, but, and then what they did is they said, oh, well, that's just because they're poor. Well, and that's just because they're on lack of education. Well, what they did is compared middle-class white, black, black and white women, all, they had to be college graduates. So they were, you know, we would say, we would say they were educated and they and looked at their incidence of premature babies. And they found that, that the pre, black college educated middle-class women had premature babies at the same or lower rate than white, poor, uneducated women. And we don't know, we don't, we as doctors don't know why today, but it, that's a fact. And the reason why our infant mortality rate is so high, continue to be so high, is because of low birth weight babies. And we, as I said, we don't know why. I, I, maybe it's the stress, but again, we are saying that we don't really understand and know the full impact and reason for that. We know that poverty, we mentioned that. And, and we, everybody knows that poor, common, poor countries have poor health than rich countries. We all know that black people tend to be poorer than white people and, and, and rich, there are more poor white people than there are poor black people, but on a percentage wise, the other thing you know that we don't have we don't have as many doctors. You heard earlier that we're whereas we're fourteen percent of the population, whereas the whites are sixty plus percent of the population, but we make up only four percent of the doctors. We've got to have more doctors, more nurses going into healthcare professions if we're going to really be able to change some of what's going on and some of what's happening. We, we talked about, we probably did as well as we did, someone mentioned, is maybe have been our, our, the nu nutrition, our nutrition. Well, of course, you know, now we all, yeah, the only thing, the thing, our children think potato chips come in the bag. They don't know potato chips. Yeah, they, they don't know you get them from potatoes. They don't know milk come from cows and eggs come from chickens. That's just because our children are just not aware. But see, before we all lived on the farm and we all knew that kind of information came with us. So let, what are some of the strategies we've got to take that we're going to, if we talk about Blacks, we markedly improved the number of Blacks in Arkansas, Black physicians. We are improving the education of Black physicians and nurses in Arkansas. And, and and the numbers, as you said, I knew Doc. I I used to know every black physician in Arkansas. Taught most of them, yeah, you know, for a while. I taught most of the doctors in Arkansas, being on the faculty. So it's I didn't teach Dr. I didn't teach Dr. Brown and Dr. White and and Dr. So, but I'm just saying that there were some some things that have changed. So we have lots of more black students in medical school, but not nearly enough. With 14% of students in medical school was black back in the good old days. 
but in but now it, it dropped down to one and two and three percent. Now it's coming up again. We have more. So and and they're working hard to try and get more. But that's not just from Arkansas. That's all over the country. And so we've got to get more of our young black people go in schools in Arkansas. And if we want to improve health and wellness, you know, health and wellness, just because health and and just because we talk about health, that doesn't mean we're all health. The, the wellness and health is the same. Sometimes wellness with health, we're talking about if you aren't sick and don't and not diagnosed with the disease. But you, you, we've got, we've got to be. We need to be healthy, and we need to have good health care. So that we can, in order, if we want to change and move our statistics, well, some what are some of the strategies we've got to take if we're going to make a real difference? Again, I'm zooming through. I'm sorry, but uh, the first strategy I think we've got to have is an educational strategy. We've got to educate all of our people if we want to make a difference. You know, my motivation was to get out of the cotton patch. Nothing, whatever I had to do, what, whatever, my mom always we always had to do our best. And if you want to get out of the cotton patch, you got to get something in your head. So that was my motivation. Dr. Edith Irby Jones, you heard about her. She, she came and gave a talk at uh, Philander Smith College when I was a student. And I thought, well, my, I didn't even know. You see, we didn't have all TV and all that going on. And you can't be what you can't see. People say, oh, Dr. Ellis, did you always want to be the Surgeon General? How could I want to be the Surgeon General? I didn't even, even know you could be a doctor. So and I didn't know about being a doctor. <clears throat> and we never, I never saw a doctor until I went to Philander Smith College. So, yeah, so I couldn't grow up with always wanting to be a surgeon general. But I want you to, do it. It, it, it meant a lot to me and I enjoyed being, being a doctor. I enjoyed being the surgeon general. I enjoyed being the health director of Arkansas. And I want you to know I tried to take advantage of every advantage I got. And I didn't always, and I know that they weren't always right, right there. Uh, we, we have to have, Access strategies. I re when I think about access, I'll never forget my brother, little brother, who was probably three or four years old. He got appendicitis, and no, you know, there was no black doctors. You know, you could think about that. But my daddy had to take my brother thirteen miles on the back of a mule. Oh Jesus! Uh, 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 to a gurney and sit and wait until he had seen all of the, his white patients. And thank God he saw my brother. Uh, uh, and he, what he did is he, 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 he treated him like he would treat a mule or a cow. And he opened up, his, stuck a, a, put a drainage in his abdomen and drained it. My brother got well. And I want, you know, he became a veterinarian. Went to Tuskegee and became a veterinarian. So I'm saying lots, but, but that's, real progress as far as I'm, but at, there was no access because even if the doctor wanted to admit him to the hospitals down in Howard County at that time, you couldn't admit him. They couldn't, they couldn't admit black children to white hospitals at that time. We've got, you've got to have prevention strategies. We've got to focus on preventing problems. I want you to know COVID-19 has opened a lot of eyes. And, and converted it. We now, many of us have 20, 20 vision and we can see, and I hope we do something because it certainly exposed our weak underbelly for this whole nation and for the whole world. And we can't, we can't cure, wipe out major infectious diseases. Want, we've got, unless we take care of everybody, we've got to provide equity and equality of care. And I want you to know providing everybody the same thing is not equity. There's a great big difference between equality and equity. 
And if we want to move, remove the barriers, that's the best way to make things equal. And heaven knows we've had loads and loads of barriers. And so we'll start removing some of the barriers we've got there. We've got to have some compassion strategies. We've got to give, deal with some of some more political strategies. We've come a long way. We're proud of President Biden and certainly proud of our vice president. But I want you to know that's not enough. We've got to do more. Martin Luther King told us years and years ago, we've got to go to school go to work and do something. My daddy, we did, We lived in a three room leaky shack, but my daddy always tried to take care of his poll tax so he could vote because you had to have a poll tax to go vote. And we're trying to let it go slip back to that stage. And I hope we've got to work to make sure that that, that doesn't ha happen. So we can always, because one of the most important things we've got if we want to preserve our black history, we better preserve our right to vote because we can see what can happen. We got to have some leadership strategies and we're developing some of those and I'm proud of that. And let's, I want you to think about what has been said, it's called the five C's of leadership. When we as black people, We've got to have this. First of all, we've got to have clarity of vision. We've got to know what it is we want, know where we want to go, and we've got to know how to get there. And so we and, and so very very often we don't even we haven't even visualized what we want. If you can't visualize it, you, you can't conceptualize it, and you can't, con can't conceptualize it, you sure can't actualize it and make it happen. So we've got to have a clarity of vision. We've got to be competent to do the job. Very often we've been competent to do the job, but you know, there, but for regardless of the job, we've got to have the competence to do the job. We've got to be consistent. You know, we can't go this way today and that way tomorrow. We've got to be consistent and know where we're going and make sure all of our children have what, Health, uh, healthy, they got to be educated, they've got to mm -hmm. be motivated, and they've got to have hope for the future. And it's our responsibility to give them hope for the future, to, to make things happen. And we've got to have, be, we've got to com be committed to making it happen. You know, you have to work at it all the time. We've got to make sure that we are, have commitment you've got to devote Devote, devote our time, our talent, and yes, we have to dig down in our pocketbooks, sometimes a little deeper than we've been doing, and we've got to have control. And we've not had that much, but we've got to have more control. And we've got to have what we call, we've got to be able to build and work coalitions in, in order to make things happen. And when I think about some of the things that's kept me pushing and kept me going is a, a poem, some poems my husband and always reminds me of and of things that Dr. Martin Luther King once said at his commencement address at UAPB. And you know, we, we all have to have some leadership strategies, things that keep us going. And so I want him to give you that poem because I want, you know, every time I give up, I reach back and I say, sure, tell, and he does. And so, Jim, I want you to tell them that poem. I'm gonna move and let him give you that poem because that's the thing that kept me going. Thank you very much. It's, it's wonderful what's going on here at this time. There's not enough of it, but you are certainly giving it to us 
the way it is, the way it should be, and 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 you should keep it up. Uh, at one of the uh, Bacchial Arts at UAPB in uh, 1961, uh, he gave a commencement uh, exercise there. And, and it went like that, he said, young people who live in this world today must burn the midnight oil because doors of opportunity are open to you right now that were not open to your mothers and your daddies. And an opportunity is kind of like a bald-headed man with a sprig of hair planted in the front of his forehead. And you've got to grab it while it is facing you because once the head is turned, the opportunity is no longer there. So you've got to go out and aspire to do a good job. Do a job so well that none could do it better. Now, don't go out there and just try to do a good old ordinary job or be a good ordinary uh, doctor, a good ordinary lawyer, but do one so well that the world will recognize you and your claim to fame and come and beat an unbeaten path and knock at your door. Do one so well that no one can do it better, the living, the dead, or the unborn. And if it falls your life to be a street sweeper, Go on out and sweep streets like Michelangelo painted pictures. Sweep oh, streets now. like Jabbar shot his hook. Sweep streets like Ray Charles sang the blues. And sweep streets like Michael, da Michael Jackson danced. And when you pass on, let the world pause and say, here lies a great street sweeper, and he swept his job well. If you oh, can't now. be a pine on the hill, just be a scrub in the valley. If you can't be a highway, be a trail. If you can't be the sun, be an evening star. For it is not by size that you win or fail, brothers and sisters. Just be the best of whoever you are. And go on out and take that potion that's been given to you and try to make a difference in the world. And if there is such a thing as luck, it'll come from my and your conduct. So if you wish good luck to pass, sow good seed and stay in line. Thank you. And you all keep at it. Thank you very much. And we'll let, you know, I, you know, I can talk all day, but we, we've had such good speakers and, we, and I will, and I'll, and I, whatever I have to finish, we'll just leave it there and let them ask me anything they want to and I'll answer that. Yes, I have uh, a few questions. Uh, I'm gonna start one. But first, before I ask the question, I'm gonna need a copy of that poem so I can post it on my wall. So if I can get okay. you. All right. I need one. He's listening. Yes, thank you. Uh, the first question uh, we have, are African-American student numbers increasing in studying medicine? The short, the, well, let me say the short answer is yes, it's increasing, but not nearly enough. It increased in, in 2021 and in 2020, I think about 14 or 15 percent, but that's not nearly enough. And it, and it needs to continue to increase uh, each year. But that was the first time we've, you know, we, it had gone down for years and now it's going up again. And we're proud about that. Okay. The next question is the eliminating medical mistrust among Black Americans. How do we overcome this during this pandemic? Ma'am, uh, would you mind repeating that question for me? I'm sorry, I didn't hear it well. Okay, the, uh, how do we overcome the eliminated medical mistrust among Black Americans during this pandemic? Uh, you, you've asked a very hard question that I wish I had an answer to. I think we have to keep working at it, keep educating, and keep trying. You know, it's something, you know, I think we, our mistrust of the government and, and health and doctors and all probably started years and years ago. And you, we still refer back to the Tuskegee Institute, uh, Institute a simpler study. So, so there are a lot of things that's influencing that. But I think we as Americans, we've got, uh, especially black Americans, we've got to be educated we, and educate ourselves. We can't afford or let our fear, 
future children die because we refuse to be educated and we listen to myths. We must deal with the education and knowledge. We know that the vaccines are safe. We know that, uh, that they really will prevent disease and they make a difference and that they will really make a difference. So I feel that we should all make sure that we try and go out and get ourselves, our children, our communities, our churches, get everybody involved and try and get all of us vaccinated. We don't want to die off just because of other folks' myths. Thank you. Awesome. The next question is, we know that early childhood experiences determine later adult successes. Can you comment on the historical course of discrimination in children's health during your lifetime? Well, we made, we made lots of progress and throughout children's health and children's education was, you know, there are wide disparities. You know, I'm always saying children are as half as tall as they'll ever be by the time they're three. They know half as much as they'll ever know by the time they're four. Hope, will, and drive has been determined by the time they're five. So we should all be out there pushing for early childhood education, get, getting children a good early start and making a real difference. And I think that that will do more to improve us than anything else that can be done. Okay, next question is, many are not as motivated as it once was many years ago. How can you actually get people motivated? What steps do we organize everyone that wants equality? Well, you know, we say everybody wants equality, but you know, I'm not sure. Yeah, and I'm not sure we all understand and appreciate equality. Well, you know, you know, I think you you saw some things that uh, great sanitarium. They were thinking, well, that was equal uh, equality, and we all know that that was not. We know there are a lot of things going on. You know, if you give two kids, one who the illustration that the government has used a lot lately. If you take a child who's six, you know, five feet tall, one who's four and a half foot tall, and one who's three foot tall, and put a fence over, uh, but if the five foot tall child can see over the fence and see the ball game, and you put give them a box, give them that. You can give them all a box. That won't make any, the five foot tall child could see well anyway. The five and a half foot tall might be able to see a little, but you give the child that was three foot tall, two boxes, he can now see it same as a child with five, five foot. So we have to make sure that things are not, we don't want to brag about them being equal. We want equity. And equality, and I think that that's where we have to uh, fight and push for to really make a difference. You know, if a child who's far behind and he gets a little tutoring, and a child who's already up gets tutoring, you know, they they just do not have the same effect, and we know that. So let's just say we've got we blacks have been under treated misrepresented for years and years and it's going to take more than a little touch to get them up to snap okay if do we have any more questions for uh dr l i don't see any more in the chat something went wrong Let's try again. our major focus from now on in the future is going to have to be, we're going to have to focus on prevention. We've got to prevent things from happening and not run around thinking, well, we can fix everything because we can't. We've got to prevent uh, many problems. We've got to deal with the programs and policies that focus on prevention. We've got to reach out. We've got to continue to do high quality, 
top level research. We've got to make sure we educate our whole community so that they will be empowered to do what, what, what we need to do. And we've got to all become advocates. We can't, everybody has to get, in, that got to be involved. Everybody got to do something and everybody can do something. And we must start now. Would you speak to reproductive health in Arkansas? Oh, well, everybody knows my, my love. See, they, they tell me often that, and I tell you, you're supposed to be speaking about this today and you're not supposed to talk about reproductive health. But you know, I feel very strongly about reproductive health. As far as I'm concerned, I feel that we all should have control over our own bodies. And it's very upsetting now to see them out there trying to overthrow Roe v. Wade. You know, boys, I, and I was never, people talk about, oh, you love abortion. I was never about ab abortions. I was about preventing unplanned pregnancies. So, I, I, and I feel very strongly about that. And, and, and so when, I'm trying to we're trying to educate the doctors. The doctors don't didn't know how to talk about sexual health. The nurses didn't know how to talk about sexual health. The parents didn't know a thing. The teachers didn't know. So how in the world were the kids going to know? You know, people go ask. But well, when I was saying about talk about condoms, it's a doctor. Elders, you know, condoms will break. I say that's right. They will break. But the bowels of abstinence break far more easily than does latex condoms. So let's just try, we want, I want everybody to have planned, wanted children. I want you to have as many as you want. If you want 20, that's fine. I don't have any, take care of 20, but I don't have any problem with that. But I don't believe in other people trying to dictate when people should have abortions, if they should have abortions, what they should do. I'm tired of people running around talking about their Christianity and how Christian and religious they are because they have a love affair with the fetus. If they love children so much, they'd make sure they had good schools, good education, and was well taken care of. And, but they don't fuss fuss about any of that. I, I, don't get, get, let me get off my heart. <laughs> I have one more question. It's another question. It says, what would make for, hold on, we got lost in the chat. See, what would make for a ideal Dr. Jocelyn Elder School of Allied and Pu Public Health in the next 20 years? What would make what? An ideal um, doctor. What would, I guess what this asking is where you see uh, the Dr. Johnson Elder School of Ally and Public Health in 20 years to be a success? Well, hopefully, I'm, I'm, I'm hopefully, the, first of all, that we'll have more young people going into uh, health, perfect, health related professions, doctors, nurses, uh, community health workers. I feel very strongly that we need to have more community health workers, people who are trained in. How, in Help keeping people healthy. We've got the best sick care system in the world. We've got the best doctors. We've got the best nurses. We do the best research, but we do not have the best health. Black and our white, you know, in the United States, we rank number 37th or 57th. And, you know, and, and we have the highest infant mortality rate below Afghanistan. So I'm saying that what we, that we had community health workers, young people that are trained to go out and work in the community about and teach young people about good nutrition, good diet, exercise, uh, not, uh, high, reducing high risky behaviors, drugs, alcohol, seeing the doctors when they need to. So there are just things that I feel that, you know, you don't have to be a doctor to train people about good health and about seeing the doctor and about taking care of themselves, about eating properly. So, so these are some of the things that I, the schools of allied health professions are, I feel are going to tra train young people 
they don't have to be training doctors and nurses only, and physical therapists, and occupational therapists, but they could be training community health workers, now allied health professionals, a people who can train people how to be healthy, how to take care of themselves and, and work in the community to teach the community how to take care of themselves. You know, we, are far, we have blood pressure much earlier. We're much more likely to die earlier. We get breast cancer. We as black women get breast cancer earlier and we're, we don't get more of it, but we're more likely to die. So there are just things that can, we can be trained to do to keep us healthier and things that we can be trained to do to keep us healthier. Awesome, awesome. Um, I'm just, just so overwhelmed with all this knowledge that I've gathered. And Me too. Only, the only regret I have about the symposium is that we were not able to actually be in your presence at the Mosaic Templars Culture Center because it would have been an honor to be in the presence of such esteemed uh, scholars. But we know that safety is first and we're all here on the Zoom taking in all this information.